but we're going to be making a start because this is a really important uh, session and it, it's not uh, without coincidence that this is in the main room so that it's being recorded because this is a subject matter uh, that really does need um, airing. There's something really beautiful, as we all know, about um, cooperation uh, and people working together to meet their collective ends. There's also a real, we're going to hear about the alignment between um, cooperation and the, the disability uh, movement. But there's also lots of things that we could be doing better as a movement. And again, um, for those of you that were, that were at our AGM yesterday, you'll hear, hear me talk about a bold new strategy for Cooperatives UK, and that includes having a real, um, building a strong and diverse movement and how we need to be the beacon in that. So I'm really delighted that we've got this uh, session because we need to understand how we can be better at this, not just uh, at Cooperatives UK, but across the whole movement. And I've got a really incredible uh, panel that are going to be introduced, but I'm over the moon to have a very uh, good friend and a, a, an amazing um, uh, cooperator, uh, not in the sense that you know it, as in she's very collaborative and does amazing kind of work across uh, campaigning for disability. And you also might recognise her from the television because she's an actor as well. Um, so I'm going to hand over now to uh, Sherry Lee Hughes to run this session. Thank you, Sherry Lake. Thank you, Rose. Good afternoon, everyone. I am so excited to be here. I am Shirley Houston. I'm a white woman, curly brown hair, sat in a very large wheelchair. Um, just a perfect example of cooperative and how disabled people work together. I started to pour the water for everybody and then realised I couldn't lift the bottle. And immediately we shared. And that's, that's, I think, hopefully, some of those principles and values that we're going to talk about throughout this afternoon. I've got a brilliant panel with me. Um, I'd like everybody, if everybody wants to introduce themselves and say a bit about themselves briefly, We'll start with you, Gregory. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Gregory Roberts. I am involved in um, disability advocacy as the carer of a son with cerebral palsy. I am an inclusive economist. I am very serious and very committed to making things happen for those who are often at the fringes. And so I'm delighted to be here with you all and to talk more about what that experience is. Um, I am on the board of the Cooperative College and I, um, with my colleagues, we are trying very much to deliver a course and courses for each of you. And in my regular day-to-day -day life, I'm a director at Strategy um, Global Consultancy where we provide consultancy services in strategy, um, in development, in economics, and so on. And I'm happy to be here with this wonderful um, panel. Thank you. Thank you, Gregory. Um, Cheryl. Hi, uh, my name's Cheryl Barrett. I'm the Vice Chair of Co-op UK. I co-chair the Co-op Party's Disability Forum. I am a co-founder of the Cooperative Guild of Social and Community Workers. I'm a mental health social worker by qualification, but a community worker by practice. I am a disabled person. I have a, what is commonly called an invisible disability. My disability affects my nervous system. I have dysautonomia which means I'm dysregulated in all the things that everybody else doesn't even think about. So that's breathing, heart rate, digestion, standing, keeping standing, sitting. And so I spend a lot of time controlled falling. So I'm not an acrobat, but I've become very acrobatic. And um, one of the things that I would like to do is break the ice amongst cooperators, you know, the able-bodied, the disabled, so that we can have conversations that make the cooperative movement inclusive and we can make the reasonable adjustments because we're not embarrassed to ask each other what those adjustments might be. Thank you, Cheryl. Steve, hello. Hi, everyone. Um, my name's Steve Graby. I am a cooperator and researcher. Um, I'm a founder member of a very small workers' co-op called Typology, and I'm now also a member of a fairly large housing co-op. Um, but the main thing that I'm here as is research in the field of disability studies, and in the last year, um, year and a half-ish, um, 
I did research projects about disabled people's involvement in co-ops, so including workers' co-ops, housing co-ops, uh, and multi-stakeholder co-ops. Um, and, um, yeah, but also a person with a so-called hidden disability, although that's a bit of a contentious term, but yeah, I am doubly neurodivergent, autistic and ADHD, so if I uh, ramble off topic or have difficulty keeping time, um, that's probably why. Um, I, I'm sure Shirley, being a, a very experienced um, chair and such, can, uh, can rein me in if necessary. I'm happy uh, to help. I'm also a fellow neuro ADHD, so I great. understand some of those. <laughs> rabbit holes that we all tend to go down. Steve, it, it, fantastic. It was really exciting to hear about your research. It'd be great if you could tell us a, an overview of the research and also why you did that. That'd be, you know, what were the key aims behind it? Okay, um, so why I did it, well, I, I suppose I've been involved in both the disabled people's movement and cooperatives um, in one way or another for 10 or 15 years. Um, and I've thought for a long time that there are significant commonalities between the two that haven't been explored enough. Um, so yeah, I got the funding to do this research from the Independent Social Research Foundation, who basically, they're a, a funding body that funds uh, research projects that perhaps more mainstream funding bodies wouldn't fund. Um, is everyone okay with, with the sound from this mic, by the way? I'm hearing an echo, and I don't know if other people are. Okay, um, so yeah, basically um, there were three parts to it initially. There was a, um, a survey of co-ops which actually didn't produce very good results, but the main parts of it were um, semi-structured interviews with disabled people who either were at the time of interview or had previously been members of co-ops. So most of those members of either workers' co-ops or housing co-ops, in some cases both. Um, and also some case studies of some individual co-ops, um, which were specializing in things to do with disabled people. So one of those was Signalize, so I know we've got people here from. Um, another one was um, Colm Valley Care Cooperative, and the third one was Enabled Works, um, which is a really interesting workers' co-op that came out of the closure about 10 years ago of a um, government-funded sheltered workshop for disabled people, which when that was closed down, um, some of its members uh, basically managed to take over its operations as a workers' co-op, and yeah, I can talk a bit more about any of those later if you like. Um, but I suppose the, to give a very general overview of um, the things that I found, um, there was a lot of confirmation of, of uh, the synergies, I would say, between disabled people and cooperatives, or the disabled people's movement and the cooperative movement in terms of, of some key shared values, so values of inclusivity and egalitarianism, values of uh, control by the most affected in a particular situation, or what the disabled people's movement calls nothing about us without us, which obviously is also the cooperative principle of member democratic control. Um, a kind of a mutual support and solidarity that's not from a top-down charity kind of way, but that is from a, a grassroots bottom-up perspective. Um, which is linked to an idea of collective self-determination, um, which is very important in the disabled people's movement concept of independent living, um, and fitting with the other core disabled people's movement concepts of the social model of disability, um, which is basically the idea that people are not disabled by their own impairments or physical or mental conditions, but by the inaccessibility of the society that we're living in. Um, a thing that a lot of my participants found very important in regards to the co-ops uh, that they were members of was a focus on changing environments, so living and working environments to fit people rather than changing people to fit environments. Um, and I think a really big thing for a lot of disabled people who are in co-ops was the fact that the self-control of being a, co a cooperator rather than, say, in housing renting from a private landlord or from the council or, or in employment, you know, working in a, a corporation where somebody else is the boss, if you're in control collectively, you can change conditions to accommodate people's differences and people's needs. Um, so I can talk about examples of that if you like, or you know, I'm aware that we've got a relatively short amount of time, so up to you, I suppose, what you want me to talk more about. That's fantastic, thank you. That's really interesting, all the different things you're saying there. And actually, I think it's really key, is the bit you're saying there, Steve, is that having that onus of people being able to voice their own decisions, because for so long, we all know this, and we've all seen it in our history, disabled people have, have never had the voice. We've had things done for us, 
by other people, by people who are non-disabled, who made those choices of what they felt was best. And actually what's really happening now in the disabled people's movement, are they coming together collectively, aren't they, Cheryl? And you were one of um, the people that Steve studied. If you'd like to tell us more around that, please. It was very interesting because I, as a disabled person who navigated the able-bodied cooperative world, if that makes sense, you know, the, the world is primarily able-bodied. So you're navigating an, uh, an able-bodied world that has values and principles that are very similar to the collective of disabled people and the way that we speak about ourselves, define ourselves, and also, I think, linked to the civil rights movement by heritage, um, Irish traveller heritage. So there was a lot of synergies for me. And as someone who's been a community worker and used cooperation as, as a tool, there was two things that happened for me. One was a cathartic kind of thing. It almost became a counselling session. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and, and Steve was great because there was a lot of... of things that had happened on that journey of trying to stay in, fit in. I've been the vice chair of the co-op party, the vice chair of Co-ops UK, and there was a lot of time when navigating that able-bodied world, I had to negate a lot of things that would have made it much easier for me in order to feel that I was keeping up and that I, w well, I would be recognised as able to be the a vice chair or a chair. So that's really interesting. That's a th is that a theme, Steve, that came throughout as well, that people feel that they have to fit in? You were talking about this as well, Gregory, weren't you, about the changes. Yes. People don't make changes to enable people to fit in. You were talking... Uh, if you'd like to tell yeah. us a little bit yes. more about that um, yourself. I think, I think the example that, that um, we reflected on was just the fact that families with disabled members, disabled children... Uh, shall I say, it grows on us so that you almost take it for granted until there's a moment of reflection to say, aha, uh -huh, we have to review where we're going for a holiday. If, if the, is there gravel on the path leading up to one of the, one of the villas or, or one, of the, one of the places of sleep? Um, have they ever delivered service to, to, to disabled people? What is the pool like? Um, do they have people who might take a, you know, just a look on, on your child while um, mom and dad might go to have a drink or something like that? All these are things, questions and many others that must be answered you know, by families and carers who are simply going on a holiday. <laughs> so um, there are issues. It's, really, uh, it's yes. really interesting what you're saying, Larry, because you're, you're listing things that you've had to consider or adapt, yeah. and it's the same with you, Cheryl. You're saying that people haven't almost offered things to enable you to then adapt, and mm -hmm. it's, it's like having your best holiday, uh, putting your best practice, putting your best work yeah. forward. Mm -hmm. Was this a theme that came up a lot, Steve, that people feel that they have to fit in rather than they can voice what their different needs are? Are you talking are? about within co-ops? Um, oh, yeah, great to talk about. Uh, life in general and co-ops, because I know co-ops are keen to make changes in different ways. Yeah, um, so I think this was a very key thing, actually, that came up in my research. Um, so the level of understanding of issues around disability and disabled cooperators' access needs within the co-ops that people are into members of was very varied. There were some people who had some quite negative experiences, at least one person who essentially felt that they were bullied out of the co-op because of um, their access needs not being met or being sort of, you know, perhaps willfully refused to be met. Um, that was quite a particular situation. Um, on the other hand, there were people who felt very much like, even though the other people, when they joined the cooperative, they were the first disabled person who'd been a member of it. This happened to both workers and housing cooperatives, that because of of the cooperative values, other people in the co-op got it very intuitively about what their access needs were, and of course, of course, they would, would meet them and would, you know, would would apply flexibility. Um, but people did encounter some. Um, what you say about fitting in that that there were a few people who, for example, um, one larger workers' co-op that I interviewed two disabled members of. Um, 
those people had struggled a little bit with at first there had been an expectation that every, every member of the co-op would be able to do every job in the co-op, um, which I think was a very laudable principle, you know, coming from you know, a radical idea of equality, of, of you know, we, we don't have bosses or managers whose work is somehow seen as more valuable than everybody else's work, so the, the idea of everybody doing everything was, was you know, felt, felt in that co-op to be quite core cool, um, to the co-op identity. But for some disabled members who, you know, whether because of a physical or, or a cognitive impairment, may find a particular job very difficult, even though that, and be expected to be able to do that, even though it was quite peripheral in some ways to what they mm. they had to do. That so that was one thing that people talked about a struggle with. Um, and within housing co-ops, obviously housing co-ops are a big spectrum of different attitudes towards kind of how communally people live within them. So I'm talking mostly about the much smaller ones where, um, you know, it's one big house and there's maybe 10 or 12 people, you know, sharing one big kitchen and living quite commonly. That was a bit of a double-edged sword. So some, some disabled cooperators found that incredibly positive because it basically met their care or social reproduction needs on a very sort of background level where you know it wasn't necessarily about sort of something that you'd be able to get funding from social services for but it was more a background level of well if i'm struggling with um with cooking today somebody else is going to cook today all that you know all that kind of thing um for other people you know the the potential for interpersonal conflicts was a big source of anxiety or sort of expectations around I guess having to be very sociable with a lot of people all the time were things that they struggled with. For some people, both those things were going on at the same time. Um, it's interesting, isn't it? Because a lot of that's down to dialogue and people being able to feel that they are in a place where they can have those conversations. Um, and I think one of the key things we wanted to do as a panel, we're keen to do, was open the conversation up to you guys as well. So this isn't a, a passive discussion because on stage you've got a lot of great lived experience and great knowledge here. So it's key, isn't it, Show, how to make this change within co-ops and, yeah. and it's finding out where you guys are at in the co-ops and how much you, where your starting points are for the next change because some of those things that Steve's mentioned in your research is about, you know, just simple things like, um, because I think people sort of think that, that that thing that everybody has to do the same means that everybody should be physically able to do the same, whereas actually somebody's brain might be used better. I know I'm certainly better at talking than I am at lifting things and moving things. Do you know what I mean? So put people to their best use in a way, yeah. I suppose is the ethos. So it'd be great. Has anybody got any questions or does anybody feel that they are integrating disabled? I suppose first question, are disabled people integrated within your co-ops? Do you feel that that is something that's happening or uh, a raise of hands of feeling that there could be a change and how we can support that. Do you feel that, sorry, just to point, just because you've answered us really. <laughs> you didn't, uh, but do you feel that you, so you're just saying though that it feels that you're, there okay. is integration. Okay. Brilliant. Lady Sorry. at the back. When do you release Central Care? Yay. Yay! Thank you for your help. I just wanted to say I think um, co ops do um, a lot. Um, I suffer with arthritis, and um, in my co op, um, Central, they've been really good. They, I've had conversations with managers, and they've asked me what I need and they've done exactly what I've needed, and they haven't tried to put me in a box, um, and they have conversations with all different um, people with, with what's, the, what's wrong with them to get them help that they need to support them. So that's what I found all the way through my journey with the co-op. Oh, that's brilliant. That's really positive. And I think that's, that's something, isn't it, Cheryl, that could be yeah. taken in to the co-op. Co I mean, what, what, what would your key guides be of how to approach ensuring that disabled people are included so they can participate 
because it, it's about everybody participating, not to the same um, ex extent in a way, isn't it? If yeah. you'd like to talk yeah. us through that a bit more, please. Yeah, I, th I think um, we have to, uh, and I think we do in, in the court world, understand that disability doesn't mean one thing, that it's various. The impairment that a person might have doesn't affect them the same way as it might affect another person. We're very individual and we're very individual in our needs, we're very individual in our aspirations and we're very individual in what we can bring to the co-op world just like everybody else. So um, I think what, what I pulled out of that day was there was some joy and some sorrow in hearing other people's experiences and, and enjoying an experience like yours, that this is great. Having some sorrow where, you know, other experiences that are not great, but absolutely feeling that the co-op movement, there's an open door that we just need to, to ask. We, we need to have an ask. And what the ask that came to me listening to, to all those people on that day was that all we want is for the values and principles of cooperation to apply to us equitably. That we're not in the cooperative movement to be done to. That we are co-owners, that we are co-operators, that there is an equity within the movement. And to enable that, that we don't have any embarrassment between ourselves, between the able-bodied and the disabled, so that we can just have that ask that for me to be an equal member of the co-op I'm in, I will need this, this and this. But I had a conversation with somebody yesterday. Um, what I might need in terms of, uh, because I'm time rich, because I'm disabled, I cannot work. I can't, I'm not, my body is not reliable for me to be able to get a contract and say I can do this because I don't know at any time whether I, I don't even know now what I'm speaking to if I'll get to the end of the sentence. It's, it's that volatile if your nervous system and your immune system are just dysregulated. That's how it is. So if you bear with me and kind of and accept that's how it is, but even in, within that, I'm still a valid member and I do bring something to the party and that that is mutual and I can be mutual. That would be my ask. But different people have different asks in this movement. And so I think it's negotiable. And that's what I'm asking for, is the negotiation within the movement between us all. But the other person I was talking to, he was time poor because he works full time. So the reasonable adjustment that allows me to be able to do it in my time allows him to be able to participate in his time because he's got to work and he's got a family. And do you see what I mean? So if it works for us, if those reasonable adjustments work for us, they work for everybody because we just have a culture of being flexible and working around people to allow everybody to participate and engage in, in the best way for them. It, it's what co-ops are good at. So I, I think we're tweaking here to make something that is currently good brilliant. So a really good example from that would be ask everybody what their access is because yeah. as you described, that gentleman was time poor. His access to engage meant he needed support in, certain, in a different, entirely different way to you did. And I think that's what is really interesting about access, isn't it, Gregory? Because yeah. people assume access is just for one individual or the disabled individual. And surely you've had examples where access um, in your family has enabled other people to do things that they wouldn't have been able to do if that access Ab hadn't been put in place. Absolutely, absolutely. And I think in a very real way for the movement, it's just to have the conversations, as it were, to, to open the channels, to speak with each other, to know more about um, what, 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 what we might need as, as a unit, as a whole body, uh, as, a, as a group of people. Uh, I think it was Martin Luther who referred to this um, um, garment of destiny and, and uh, commonality in one of his, his letters. We have it already. We are cooperators. We are used to that. We are decent, 
We, we know what we want for ourselves, and so it's just to find out how can I make that happen for the next person. I find that really exciting as well because I think cooperators, cooperatives are going to be the most keen people to be solution focused and Absolutely. to incorporate uh, deaf, disabled and neurodivergent people because so often, I think the one thing to remember is our communities have been so used to being told this isn't for you, this, you're not to be included, the only way you can be included is if you fit in to whatever our perception is of how people should be. Steve, you're, you're nodding. Did that come up quite often? Yeah, I mean, to pick up particularly on what Cheryl just said about being time rich and time poor and flexible ways of working, um, that was one of the very key things that came up, particularly in the people who I interviewed who are members of workers' co-ops. Um, because, and also according, you know, with my own experience, because the reason I, I started um, a small workers' co-op along with a couple of other people in similar situations um, was essentially because feeling like there were, you know, disabling barriers um, that were in the way of either of us getting, um, you know, so-called regular employment and starting a workers' co-op that was <clears throat> quite explicitly at, at the time three uh, myself and the other two co-founders were living in different cities and so we were working entirely from home in different places, working remotely. This was long before the pandemic. Um, obviously, that this has become a slightly more normal way of working now and there's you know, a lot I could say about the pandemic and disability that I absolutely don't have the time or space to go into right now. But um, yes, yeah, se several of the people I interviewed had also founded workers' co-ops for very similar reasons and several people uh, felt very strongly that it was only in the workers' co-op that they could actually be uh, in self-supporting employment at all, um, simply because of, of things like, for example, um, to give an example for myself, um, I, I have quite, uh, I have difficulties with sleeping. It's very, it would be almost impossible for me to work a nine to five day, um, but being in a workers' co-op where we set our own working hours, I can work out the times when I'm capable of working and, and you know, it doesn't matter whether that's nights, whether that's weekends, um, you know, wh whether or not that fits into the so-called normal working day pattern. Um, and, you know, people talked about um, Enabled Works was a really interesting example as well, because although, you know, they're a warehouse-based thing with a physical workplace, so they do have more of a nine-to-five working day, but um, several of the people I interviewed there talked about how it was sort of seen as a talent of one of the co-founders of knowing exactly how to put the right people on an assembly line in the right order so that the job could be done with each person doing the bits of the job that, that you know, within their impairments and their capacities they were physically capable of doing. And if you put the same people on an assembly line in a different order, it wouldn't be possible to do it like that. So this element of flexibility coming up in multiple different ways, um, I think is very, very core to the co-op advantage for disabled cooperators and similarly in housing co-ops obviously it's a very different context but you know people being able to make adaptations to their own housing that you know a private landlord or even a social landlord would never allow them to um, and that can range from quite obvious things like wheelchair ramps um, to things that might seem as much less obvious so for example in one large student housing co-op um, that I interviewed a couple of members of um, who were neurodivergent, they talked about things like being able to change, to, um, to paint the walls different colours and to change the lighting uh, in their rooms so that it, it you know, fitted their, their sensory comfort needs, which, you know, it's a very small thing that wouldn't necessarily even be seen as an access need by a lot of people, but it's the sort of thing that private landlords would often just refuse to let people do. So, yeah, I think that's a very core element of what makes co-ops sort of potentially so life-changing for disabled people, which, you know, is an, obviously an indictment of, of how petty and awful capitalist society is, but, you know, yeah, that's... That's really interesting, because it's really key how cooperatives can lead this change in inclusivity, isn't it? Because all those things you just mentioned there make so much sense, and actually it's about somebody living a better life doing that. And I think, Cheryl, if you can talk a bit more about the disabled people's movement, because we, yeah. we're very similar in that way, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. And I think as well, the, the, for me, the big correlation between the disabled movement, nothing about us without us, and the co-op movement, nothing about us without us in terms of equal membership, there's a clear understand, understanding there that we have the right to be autonomous, 
not to be done to, but to be doing with in a collective. And if you've got an impairment, sometimes you cannot do it on your own. But if it's a natural phenomenon that you're doing things to get there and you can add something as well as subtract something, that it is mutual, you maintain your dignity mm. in, in your personhood. And if we can move that into our labor, all of us here know how hostile it is in the world outside for disabled people. Me sitting here now and being recorded, I've got pit for life. I've got pit for life, because one of the things that is said about me in jest, but it's true, and I don't mind because it helps spread the message, is Cheryl Barrett does her best work in bed. Because if I'm laid flat, I'm less likely to dysregulate, mm. Therefore, I can think better, I can concentrate better, I'm less likely to get the adrenaline that will give me adrenaline fatigue. I'll get the fatigue anyway, just trying to keep upright and sitting up. And that doesn't mean I want to be confined to my bed. I have enjoyed coming out, meeting everybody, and I do have to amble between the chairs and just in case there's a control fall. But most people know it, leave me to it. If I fell on the floor, just leave me for a while, because the blood will go back to my head and I'll get up. If when my eyes are opened I don't get up, that's the time to kind of give me a, a shake and get me up. But, but what I wanted to say was, we are being coerced and forced by the DWP into work that we cannot possibly do. We will fail, we will lose our benefit, and we're sitting speaking to you today. There are disabled people who don't have a voice, who are being coerced, who are are not living lives because they dare apply for benefit or they can't work and they need the benefit and then they are so regulated and have to conform. I can't work because nobody would employ me because I'm not, I, I feel as a person I'm a reliable person. I don't have a reliable body and there's a difference between who I am as a person and what my body will and won't do. And, and I think I'm accepted. But well, most people here, I'm accepted as, as a reliable person. I'm just operating in an unreliable body. The DWP won't do that. So I'm fortunate that I have a GP who has noted that for me this is therapy, that if I didn't do this, my mental health would be so severely affected that I couldn't participate, I couldn't be a person, I couldn't give any benefit to the world, I can only extract from the world. Who wants to live like that? And mm. that's the thing, so many disabled people are being forced to live forced like that. Forced to live like that. And what you're saying, Cheryl, like when we met, I was laid down and my computer on its side, yeah. so I was working from bed. And I think there's that thing, isn't there, because there's, there's almost, there's a fear of being sh the disabled person allowing the world to see that side of them as well. Yeah. And I think that's where co-ops can really come in yeah. by inviting that, you know, the, yeah. the offering. Because I presume in co-ops you offer how you can work. Yeah. So yeah. is that something you'd encourage as well? Is, what, what, is, what would the key bits of advice you'd say about having those conversations and how to facilitate those conversations? Absolutely. And if we can be who we really are and operate within the co-op world as we really are, Sometimes laid down, <laughs> sometimes wheeled, sometimes because sometimes I'm on wheels, sometimes I'm on feet, sometimes I'm on my arse trying to get up. You know that that's the reality of it. But there is opportunities in the co-op world to create employment that we can do. Nobody would employ me, but the DWP, after trying to push me into employment that I couldn't do, finally gave up the ghost and let me have the pension that I'd worked. 30 odd years to earn, you, you know, to me. But they would take it back off me again. If they, and it, it's so weird that we're given something, and if by using that something we are enabled, they take it off us and make us disabled again. And that's the whole point about it's, it's not just the impairment that disables us, it's the way we have to navigate the world and the hostility in the wider world. And Cooperation for us is a refuge. This is our oasis and the place where we can design a world where some of us that currently cannot work could work because we can do our best work lying down. We can do our best work when we're able and sleep and rest when we're unable. 
but still be considered, considered a valued member. We're still a valued member. And there's, you know, there's people at the back of this room, so shout out to Alan Dutson from SCDG, who, does, who works like that as a cooperator. And, and Chrissy, the lady at the back, Chrissy, if you need her, any disabled people, because this is going online, she fights in court for people to be able to get their pit or to, to, to stay in work, whatever. There are disabled people who are cooperators who are, we're doing this, we're already doing this. So if we could get the support in the co-op movement to do more of this, to mainstream this, that it's completely normal for a disabled person to be part of a co-op, and not only a co-op that is wanting to do things to or for disabled people. And, you know, I've got my granddaughter in here today. We have a relationship as granddaughter and grandma. We also have a relationship as OT, support worker, to get me here today. Yeah. You know, we have relationships that are very fluid. And co-ops can help us to maintain our relationships, not to disrupt our relationships. And, and to be in the world. And the co-ops can learn from that as well, Absolutely. can't they? Because, Gregor, you're, you're nodding. And also, I mean, this is quite a tricky question, but as a, a parent, you know, it's looking at how, you know, your family member, but you want, you obviously want the changes to happen to ensure that, that um, your family member doesn't have the experiences, say, I had. Do you know what I mean? Where can, do you feel co-ops co can come in to, with that? Because you've obviously got a lot of knowledge of the co-op movement as well. Yes. I, I, I totally believe that for the cooperative world, for the cooperative movement, the return to investment and all the time we spend together is not simply about um, a bit of a few pennies you get back from the cooperative group or uh, being invited here or something like that. It is to bring change and to make our society better, to make our world better. And I feel strongly that, you know, taking an approach to treat each person equitably, that is to say, we appreciate, um, not, not equally, but equitably, we appreciate the barriers to engagement, the barriers to achieving certain things, and let's remove those barriers. The barriers that might exist for, for Steve, they are different from the barriers that would exist for me. Remove the barriers so we can operate on a level playing field. And that's what I'd like for my son with cerebral palsy. As he, as he, as he grows now as, um, as a approaching 16 and therefore would be interviewed for PIP and all of that, it frightens me when, when um, Cheryl says that if she were to go abroad for a day, that could trigger a review of her support arrangement. So what would it be for my son to go see his grandma and grandpa? You know, and th these are the things that, 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 that we are, we as a, as a group together, as, as, as Nick who is sitting there always say, for every problem there's a cooperative solution. We as a group together must start pushing to bring not simply the attitudinal changes among people within the, within the cooperative group, but also the changes in the broader society. I think we are at a good place to start making things happen. Mm. And the world's listening now, aren't they? Yeah. And the world, when we were younger, weren't listening, which is a really, you know, we're in a very valuable place. What advice would you say was the key things that came out of your research, Steve, for this change? Oh, that's a hard one. Um, I would love to see the bigger cooperative organisations um, investing, not necessarily just financially, but also um, in terms of uh, time and organisational support in co-ops that are focused around disabled people. Um, because, you know, for example, at the moment, uh, a small uh, group of, of people uh, I'm in very early stages of, I mean, including some mutual friends of ours, actually, I'm in very early stages of um, talking about um, 
a personal assistant uh, user-consumer user co-op, um, which has some similarities to what Andy Burnham in the panel yesterday was talking about, but it's not quite the same. Um, and it feels, you know, lots of people would, would absolutely love that to happen. It would make a, ma a massive difference in many ways to many disabled people's lives, but the the organizational steps of getting there, and I know there are various, uh, you know, co-op support organizations out there. There are co-ops themselves that give business support to other co-ops. Unfortunately, all of these have to charge a lot of money, or disabled people don't have money. Um, it can feel quite daunting to work out how to actually start a co-op. It's something that perhaps because it's not so familiar in wider society, there's a lot of, yeah, a lot of steps involved, and it's difficult to know what order they go in. Um, so, yeah, in terms of, of sort of help and advice, uh, I would very much like, like to see, um, yeah, some, something, something around getting new co-ops started, um, as, well as, as well as existing large co-ops. Mm. Um, you know, um, there's, there's definitely advice that I can give and that other disabled people I know who are in co-ops could give towards existing established co-ops. Um, in terms of inclusivity for disabled people, but I think that, yeah, support for new co-ops that are focused around disabled people. Sorry if that was a bit off topic to your question. No, that makes a lot of sense because it's saying <coughs> that actually we need to start recognising the gaps that have been left for a lot of, well, over the whole of time really, isn't it? And where inclusivity hasn't been kept. And actually by disabled people now having a voice and, you know, like what the results are coming out of your research, you're saying there is need so as well as looking at the needs and requirements within your own co-op, it's looking at how your co-op can help other people flourish, I suppose, is that? Yeah. It? And I'd like to offer that. Um, I'm a co-founder of the Cooperative Guild of Social and Community Workers, and the majority of the social and community workers in that guild are themselves disabled, including our secretary, Pat Juby, there at the back with her dark glasses on, shielded from the light. If, um, if you want to get in touch with us, um, you know, Pat, I'll, I'll leave her email details with the feedback from here, and the Guild will signpost you into places. So if you're embarrassed about asking an individual disabled person questions, come and ask us, we'll answer them. If we can navigate you around systems and support and you know, tell you places to go, we're happy to do that. So, so we'll try to move from here. And one of the great things that solidified my mind, something, you know, when you have kind of something that you kind of do, but you haven't quantified, you haven't thought about it in a, a little short phrase. Steve did that for me. When he put his research together, he segmented it into cooperators, cooperation, and cooperatives. And I thought, I've been doing that all my life. That, that navigation. So if we can help with the navigation of disabled people with able-bodied people as cooperators within cooperate, cooperatives, but also the cooperation, you know, the stuff that is not a business, mm. but is a relational thing between people. For me to sit here and do this, A, I risk that I'm going to lose my pip and, and Chrissy's going to have to fight two years to get it me back, but it takes a cooperative to get me in this seat. Yes. Yeah. The yes. people who got me, you know, a shout out to Rose. I went to, uh, I went to that day and I went straight on the blower to Rose and said, Rose, this needs to, you know, we need to move. This, this has got to keep going. The conversation's got to get wider. We've got to keep it going. We know this is a, a, a starting, you know, the gun's fired. We're on the starting blocks. This is a process. It's, it's, it's not an end just being here. But... I know in the Guild, and I know Rose will do it, and the team at Co-ops UK will navigate people backwards and forwards. Talk to us, let's keep the conversation going, let's put some things in place, and let's get to the development workers, the worker cooperators, etc., so that what we're building and developing is inclusive. Yes. It's, it's in, the, in its DNA is inclusive. I got really excited when you just said that, let's keep the conversation going, because that's something we advocate in um, Dank, the Disabled Artist Network community, is we're not just coming in to have a chat about it, this is a chat that now what's our next step, what's our next step, what's our next step, until these conversations don't need to be had anymore, yeah. you know, until disabled people on all panels and the conversation, you know, inclusivity, because 
there's a lot of things people can learn from disability access yeah, and from disabled people themselves yeah. that is, means it's much, much richer with us than without us. Absolutely. So what, we've got about 12 minutes left, what key tips would you say would be a good starting point? Because I know that this has been recorded, so hopefully other cooperatives will be watching it. And some people might not be including disabled people in, you know, as, as well as they would like to, but maybe are stuck by terminology, maybe are stuck at the first fear of saying something wrong, or, you know, or just not knowing how to navigate those conversations. What, what would you each say would be a good tip or a good way to look at your own cooperative, and what advice would you give? Yes, I'll go first. Um, I'd say start the conversations, facilitate the conversations, um, we understand the natural tendency to engage with those who look like us, are as able as we are, our womb for some reason we think immediately that, yeah, that would help my cause. But make the engagement with others who, might who you might not be able to get anything from other than to aid in, in advocating for them. Let that be your cause. You know, we are cooperators. Let us start there. I think you made a really key point there as well, Gregory, because there's an assumption sometimes. I think that's come up quite a few times. It definitely came up in, Steve, in some of the stuff Steve was talking about, is people make assumptions of what somebody needs. Or if somebody's communication requirements are different, mm -hmm. then people say, oh, I'll, it'll be easier. It will just be easier if I say it for you. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. you won't be saying what that person requires. So t it's taking the time, isn't it? Yes. Find the way to engage with somebody because everybody has a different way to communicate. And actually that makes it much richer in your co-op itself as well. Absolutely. Cheryl? I, mine would be the same, is, is don't make an assumption, ask. And if you don't know who to ask, we will help, we will help you navigate with that ask. Uh, and it, you know, not every disabled person might want to get into the conversation at that time or at all, but we can make sure that you can get to people who will. But again, because you've spoken to one person, and there are collectives of disabled people, you know, coming yeah. now, the, the people who are part of Steve's research have kept together. Brilliant. The, the co-op party has got the disability forum, and when we spoke to Joe and we set that up, we said, we don't just want to be the disability group for the co-op party. We're not just a resource for you. We are a collective of disabled people. We want to be able to work with the whole of the movement and mm -hmm. with the disability movement outside and with the unions and everybody else, yeah? And he said, go for it. Excellent. Yeah. So, that, so we're, we're starting to have a visible presence with a telephone number you can ring, which, which is useful for, for both of us. So please, please do. That's really exciting because it is, we need a presence yeah. and it stops, it's, because the thing is, I think, and I think my industry, the media industry is responsible, the storytelling industry is responsible for a lot of attitudinals, mm. hammering in the wrong opinion of that we should be fixed, we should be cured, we should be saved, that we're, we're less than, whether we're other, and that, mm. as that is changing, I think we, as, you know, as disabled people, we, need to grab this change and, uh, and use the voices that people are now allowing us to have. Steve, what would your advice uh, be? Well, I can mainly would, would like to second what Gregory and Cheryl have both just said, make the contact with disabled people and disabled people's organisations. I think if the, the thing that from my particular perspective I would add to that is disabled people's organisations and cooperatives and the cooperative movement have in some ways got very similar and very parallel histories and very similar and very parallel principles but they haven't necessarily had a lot of contact with each other so immediately after the event that, uh, that Cheryl and, and I had back in uh, in March that Cheryl was referred to a few times um, that, that sort of marked the culmination of my research I then uh, Straight after that, got a full-time job uh, working on a disabled people's archive project for Greater Manchester Coalition of Disabled People, which is one of the longest-standing disabled people's organisations in the UK. I've been involved in them on and off for, for quite a few years before that already. Um, my having got that job is the reason why I haven't 
completed and put online my research report yet, so that's a little bit hanging in limbo, although there are some shorter things in my presentation from that, um, that event which, which are uh, available online. Um, but the, the reason for mentioning that is looking at the history and, and as you mentioned, Shirley, the media industry, um, you know, I, I've been working with documents um, including, you know, magazines from disabled people's organisations going back to the 80s and 90s, you know, talking about disabled people's representation in, in TV and film then. Um, you know, th th there's a long history and a long, uh, a, a, you know, a huge body of, of criticism of, um, of, of you know dialogue and planning um, coming from the disabled people's movement that has very similar and very parallel aspects in it in many ways, particularly around self-control and self-determination um, to the cooperative movement. But it kind of seems that both both sides don't know much about each other. Disabled people's organisations haven't necessarily seen or heard much about co-ops, and co-ops haven't necessarily seen or heard much about disabled people's organisations. So. I think contact and dialogue between the two um, could be really fruitful for both. I think that's really true because it, it is that I think we have that assumption that disabled people never added a voice or never made a shift. And when you get together with a load of disabled people who are working well together to do that, it's so empowering and it's so exciting and a lot of really rich things come out, but it's never been shared. Um, just to fill you in slightly, I set up Triple C, who set up Dank. And we have uh, the Disabled Artists Network community. We've got 1,600 deaf, disabled, and or neurodivergent creatives having those dialogues with um, the industry. Because I think I, I always found that that was, and we always, you know, found that the way the media tells about us is the thing that needs to change. Because then we need our, our stories aren't on the news. That is why, you know, we, we all know that, you know, it's why. There were two out of three deaths for COVID were disabled people. You know, we had uh, do not resuscitate notices put on us. That would never have been allowed if we had a stronger voice mm -hmm. and because our, our, our voices weren't in the news. And I think that's where cooperatives can really empower and come together. Steve, that was really exciting to hear that the people who did your research have come together and are, are keeping a dialogue because that's really rich. Can you tell me a bit more about, is the way people can contact those people? So, yeah, so after the event in, in March, um, I set up an email list. I must admit, I've not done anywhere near as much with it as I could or should have done, partly because I got this full-time job straight after the event, and things have been left a bit hanging, so there hasn't been a lot of activity on it yet, but, like, you know, there are some really, you know, many really good people with, with really, you know, important stuff that they're doing in, in various different co-ops and various different disabled people's organisations who are at that event who have come together. Um, I have a website which is disabledcoops.uk and uh, an email address that I created which is dis uh, disabledcoops, or one word, at mail.com. It's just mail, not gmail. Um, and if you email me on that, then you know, it would be great to get the ball rolling a bit further than, than it currently has been. And we're really lucky to have Cheryl here, who is the vice chair. So, isn't it, so in a way, that because it'd be great if co-ops could have this on every single agenda. And I think that's probably a really good tip, is every single item on your agenda, look at access in that, or look at deaf, disabled, and neurodivergent people in that, and where, how you're including those people. Because that's the easiest shift. That's the easiest way to make the change, isn't it? Just wondering, has anybody got any questions? Thank you, Nick Matthews, Heart of England, Cooperative Society. This is more of a, uh, an observation and a comment than a question, but I think it's, it's, it, it, it's valuable because of the experience of, of what, what happened with us. We came across uh, Dr. Steve Gravy's work um, a couple of years ago when he first published the Cooperators uh, and Disabled Disability paper. Um, I, I came across it myself personally, and I showed it to our uh, guys at uh, the business uh, because I think that the, there's a, there was a sort of binary thing about disability. You're either able-bodied or you're disabled. Yeah. But actually, it's a huge spectrum, isn't it? Mm. And what brought this home to us uh, was when we were planning to do new stores, some of the daft things that, uh, well, seemed daft afterwards, which made a huge difference, was having slightly wider aisles, which make no difference whatsoever to 
you know, fully able-bodied people, but make a life's difference to people, you know, in the position that you're in, for example. And other things that I thought were really fascinating was when you put uh, tills in, the, the self-service tills, the day they go in, everybody who uses them is disabled because they don't know how to do, use the stuff. And, and what, you've, what you discover uh, is that everybody, almost everybody, needs some level of assistance and support. Uh, the other thing that we learned from, from uh, uh, Steve's work was that was a, the, the cooperative principle of autonomy and independence applies in spades to disabled people. And it's, it's that thing about making assumptions about what people need. Uh, instead of waiting a little bit and asking them <laughs> or listening to what they say they need. And, it, and, and what was refreshing, uh, uh, we changed the way we trained our staff when we did the new stores, and the, you know, to make them more sensitive to this. And what was great, a couple of weeks back, I was in one of our shops, uh, which had been gone through this process. And one of the customers was in there, they didn't know who I was from Adam, I just happened to be there. Uh, and she said to one of the staff, I said, I love your shop. I usually prefer it to a competitor down the road because of the way the staff help me when I need to do, do certain things. And I thought, that, I thought that was like, that didn't cost us anything. Mm -hmm. All we had to do was to rethink the way we trained those people in the store and what we asked them to look out for. And once they had gone through that and started doing it, they liked doing it. The, the whole atmosphere of the place was better, you know, and, more, and with the customer relationship was better. So not only is it good for the disabled people, it's bloody good for business, you know. I think you've... You summed up exactly everything there that we've been talking about is that actually you have to include deaf, disabled, neurodivergent people to find out what, they're, what would be most beneficial. But then also by implementing that, it makes a change for everybody else. And actually that is what's really key, is that it's not just about access for the disabled person or highlight, putting a spotlight on them. If you make a change for everybody else, it makes a change for business, but it also makes a better working environment for everybody. And that's really, really imperative. Yeah. Thank you, everybody. That was a really, really interesting panel. Thank you. Uh, thank you to Steve, thank you to Cheryl, and thank you to Gregory. You're welcome. Thank you, guys. And thank you to you, Sherry Lee, of course, uh, for everything you do. And like I say, this isn't, uh, you know, it's certainly uh, not the end of the conversation. It's just the start of the conversation. And we will absolutely be looking at what we can do to, to help co-ops to be much better at this.